Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 21 of Zero Fights Aliens in Xenonauts. So when we last left our heroes, we had uh, just completed a mission that against a corvette, our very first corvette, and uh, managed to get one of our own people killed, which was unfortunate, but hopefully we can uh, carry on and do better in this mission. Let's take a quick look at our base here for a second. All right, so we have some living quarters. It might be worth hiring a few additional soldiers. How many are we down to right now? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine soldiers. So we definitely want to bring on a few more. We'll start off by doing that. Uh, as much as I like the bravery and the reflexes, the time units makes that one a no-go. This is a pretty well-rounded soldier, so we'll bring them on. Uh, 35 accuracy is a no-go there. Uh, this one is pretty good. Would make a good replacement uh, heavy gunner, should we need one. And I'd like to bring on one more. Let's hire these guys and let's see if we can't maybe get some good replacements to this. So again, no to that one. 57. Yeah, we'll bring on Carol. Alright. That'll be good for now. Just get a few more soldiers in the barracks, just in case we need them. It's always good to have uh, spares kicking around. I mean extras. <laughs> Alright, so uh, not really much to say. Research is ticking along quite nicely. Actually, we might be able to bring a few scientists off of that. We'll put the extras on to Elenium Explosives, because that'll be nice. some nice research to have. We have our scatter laser and precision lasers carrying on. Oh, we should have a scatter laser before our next mission. Any kind of luck. That'll be nice. Alright, so we have a medium. Okay, so this is a Corvette. So we're going to need both of our Foxtrots to take it out. Ooh, it's going quite a ways away. Alright. As much as I would like to wait for it to go over land, it's not going to. We only have 46 seconds worth of fuel. There's no way... Um, I shouldn't say there's no way, but it's very unlikely it's going to go over land. Uh before we can shoot it down, and it's out of our radar range, so I'm just going to uh, auto-resolve this one. Oh, we took... Okay, note to self, don't auto-resolve these. I thought I'd be okay there without taking any hull damage, but apparently not. But anyway, the reason why we auto-resolve uh, that one is because they were way outside of our radar range, and I didn't want to take the risk of them getting away on us. Unfortunately, our fox trots took way more damage there than I thought they were going to. So hopefully, they'll get repaired before we need them again. Okay, so our scatter laser is finished. Excellent. Um, oh, right, you know what I should do? I should probably go in here and get our extra 20 engineers to work on something. Yeah, let's just get them all working on the precision laser for the time being. Get that done so we can get our entire squad in using lasers. Andron Disassembly. Androns are bipedal robotic infantry. They stand approximately 2 meters, 6 feet, 7 inches tall, and are constructed from the same alien materials as the hulls of the alien craft. They are heavily armored, utterly fearless, and capable of firing heavy weapons on the move, but seemingly suffer from a lack of situational awareness. Combat videos do not show a single instance of an Andron taking cover. Perhaps the aliens believe the robotic guardians invulnerable to our weapons? Either way, you should exploit this flaw in their programming. The technology used in the recovered Andron is at once simple and complex. The design is elegant. An Elenium reactor is mounted within an armored component in the android's torso and uses a branching cable running down the back of the torso to distribute power to the rest of the body. Each joint contains an array of powerful hydraulics and servo motors, allowing fine control of each of the droid's robotic limbs. Though alien materials make this design more efficient than anything we could create, the basic mechanical setup could be replicated using human technology without enormous difficulty. What human technology could never replicate is the complex network of sensors that fill almost every spare inch of the droid's internal space. We cannot even identify many of the instruments, but their collective role is obvious, recording data on the droid's surroundings and feeding it to the processing units encased in the metal skull. 
While it is an extremely effective combat unit, we have genuine questions over why the Androns exist at all. The paral parallels with organic life are obvious and clearly deliberate. It has a reactor placed where a living creature would have a heart, an, elect an electronic brain inside its armored head, even a power distribution system that mirrors the nervous system of living creatures. I can see no compelling reason to build a bipedal combat robot at all. A wheeled or track design would be much more stable, faster moving, better protected, and present a smaller battlefield target. Is it vanity? Stupidity? Puzzling to say the least. Light Drone Wreckage The Light Drone is a small saucer-shaped drone approximately 140 centimeters wide, with a thruster array mounted on the rear of the saucer and the sensors and weaponry on the front. It is capable of hovering, but is usually sighted skimming the battlefield roughly a meter above the ground. This allows it to move freely over small obstacles or otherwise impassable terrain, such as water. This assembly of the recovered records suggests that the heart of the drone is an Elenium reactor no larger than a man's fist. We assume the mass of alien circuitry that surrounds it is in fact the drone's, ele the drone's electronic brain. The lack of any visible receiver antenna suggests that these units are fully autonomous when operational. An engine array on the rear of the drone provides forward motion, while the hover effect and probably pitch and roll is generated by the dozens of small thrusters that dot the underside of the drone. The frontal part of the saucer is filled with a powerful scanner that can monitor almost the entire electro electromagnetic spectrum, giving these drones excellent sight ranges. The drone is armed with an unusual integrated weapon we have dubbed the Burst Cannon. The plasma generation array has been designed to emphasize rate of fire above all else, allowing it to be allowing it to fire extremely quickly, but leaving it underpowered even compared to the plasma pistol. A single shot would probably not even kill an unarmored civilian. As the shell of the drone itself is not even thick enough to resist sustained small arms fire, I suspect these units are disposable scout units primarily designed to locate and suppress enemies so the accompanying aliens can deal with them more easily. A support role rather than a hunter-killer role, it seems. Oh wow. Corvette UFO! The Corvette is a medium-sized UFO. It is the first genuine alien warship we have encountered exchanging the delicate wing surfaces used by the smaller UFOs as sensor amplifiers for sturdier hull construction and more powerful weapons. The armor plating of this craft is the same stuff as on the lighter UFOs, but applied in greater quantities, adding enormous survivability at the cost of greatly increased weight. The large engines mounted on the rear of the vessel are enough to keep it airborne, but it is slow and ponderous compared to the lighter craft that preceded it, and therefore vulnerable to heavy torpedoes. The power requirements of these engines necessitate both a second power core and an improved method of power transmission. The hull electronics are much more advanced than, pre than previously, so we have extracted them for further study. The primary armament of the Corvette is a forward-firing heavy plasma cannon. This has a slow rate of fire, but generates a powerful explosive projectile that is just as deadly when used to bomb ground targets as it is when used against aerial opponents. These projectiles travel relatively slowly and you may find that our more agile interceptors are able to avoid them with an evasive roll maneuver, but they will inflict heavy damage on anything they hit. Be very careful about flying your interceptors into its flying, into its firing arc. Okay, so that's everything. At least for now. How are we doing? Alright, we're doing pretty good here. I'm going to let those continue as they are. Okay, so we've run out of money again. Which is no surprise. Nearing the end of the month, so we should get a little bit of an influx here shortly. Now, oh, speaking of, our second base is finally up and running. As far or the radar array is, at least. Cassian Analysis. These pallid creatures are more disconcerting in the flesh, Commander. They are a twisted mockery of our own species, resembling us so closely that one cannot help but feel a creeping sense of revulsion when you stare into their malevolent eyes. In practical terms, a Cassian is a superior approximation of a human soldier. They are highly intelligent and accorded ex excellent situational awareness by their oversized eyes. Their manual dexterity and reflex speed is much the same as our own. They behave much like human military forces, engaging at long range and making good use of battlefield cover. Despite their frail physiology, their equipment makes them difficult to kill. Even the ubiquitous jumpsuit offers remarkable protection and is supplemented with additional protective gear at higher, at higher ranks. Scans have revealed that 
The brain tissue of these creatures is unusually active, with samples taken during autopsies suggesting that, is a, that it is extraordinarily rich in energy-dense elenium nanoparticles. As we have already established that these creatures communicate via telepathy, this hints at further, as yet unknown, mental abilities. Finally, we have concluded the analysis by collating all known vulnerabilities in KC and equipment, tactics, and physiology into a document for your soldiers. This additional knowledge should increase the damage they inflict on these enemies by approximately 10%. Alright, now I want to get them working on alien electronics because this will unlock the um, electromagnet yeah, electromagnetic grenades for us, which are very important when going up against androns. Okay, so we have another couple of hangers. Unfortunately, we are out of money. So we can't really hire, or start building another Foxtrot just yet. At least not until we get something of a mission to run. Ah, here we go. Elenium Explosives. Seems like it's going to be a research-heavy episode. Sorry, guys. Elenium Explosives. The majority of Elenium found inside wrecked UFOs has been run through the vessel's reactor, making it of little use as fuel. This low-grade Elenium only contains enough power to run an extraterrestrial de device for a few minutes, whereas fresh Elenium can do so for hours at a time. However, it turns out that there is another use for this relatively abundant low-grade Elenium. Explosives! The amount of energy held in depleted Elenium is usually still appreciably higher than is contained in the equivalent weight of TNT. My team has therefore been able to produce improved designs for all the high-explosive rockets and grenades issued to our soldiers, replacing the explosives with an Elenium charge that is up to 50% more powerful than conventional munitions. Given the ample availability of the constituent parts, these can be manufactured and issued to our soldiers in effectively unlimited numbers. Your men seem impressed, they, they spent so long testing the new devices that the firing range required structural repairs. The principle behind these devices is simple. The explosive is a block of elenium that dumps all of its energy into the surrounding air when triggered. The warhead on the rocket is sufficiently large that this will generate a sizable explosion, but the grenade also employs a steel casing that fragments into a deadly cloud of metal shards on detonation. However, be aware that these weapons will inflict as much damage on extraterrestrial equipment as on the aliens themselves. Aliens killed with explosives are unlikely to leave a corpse behind, let alone recoverable items. And then, Elenium Warheads. This low-grade Elenium can also be used to upgrade the missiles carried by our interceptors. This process was slightly more involved as our anti-air warheads rely on armor penetration as much as explosive force. Nonetheless, we have been successful. And as the new warheads can be fitted to our existing rocket engines, we have already upgraded your interceptors accordingly. The required armor penetration is achieved by fitting a small laser emitter to the top of the Elenium block. This fires in a predetermined pattern, which can be changed to allow us to shape and focus the explosive charge in any direction that we choose. With no time to conduct extensive studies on the effectiveness of different charge patterns, we instead just ensured that the energy from the blast is focused forwards rather than wastefully radiating it in all directions. Crude perhaps, but certainly functional. The Elenium missile is a direct replacement for the Sidewinder light air-to-air -air missile, while the Elenium torpedo replaces the heavy avalanche torpedo. The latter is a powerful weapon well suited to dealing with lumbering alien craft without the speed or agility to avoid it. The former, a faster missile that inflicts less damage but is more likely to hit alien lighter vessels. In both cases, the upgrades are just straightforward warhead swaps, so this should not dictate any major change in aerial tactics beyond making our engagements a little easier. Alright, so what are we going to research now? Well, first we need to get more people on the alien electronics. I want to bring that all the way up to excellent. If we can. You know what? We only have one scientist left. We might as well put him on it as well. All 30 scientists on alien electronics, at least for now, until we get a little farther on it and we can start splitting them out a little bit more. Now, I'd really like a UFO to come here so we can shoot it up and sell it for parts. Alright, we have a very small, so this guy must be a, um, a fighter. So we will send... Uh, let's see, can I move this? Looks like we have just the one fighter over here for the time being. So I'm going to send both condors after him, just to be sure. We have... this looks like a medium-sized scout. 
I forget. Do we need condors for them or foxtrots? Foxtrots, I believe. And then we have a medium. So this will be our the uh, Corvette, which with our Lenium Explosives upgrade should be able to be taken down by a single Foxtrot. Okay, so here we have our fighter. I'm going to engage him manually. Condor 1, oops, you go over there. Condor 2, you can, tear, can you continue on in that direction. Which one is he going for? Condor 1. So we'll bring Condor 2 up this way. And Condor 2 can start bringing himself over this way. Condor 1 heads straight down. And this should take him out pretty easy. Oops. Alright, still got him anyway, with no damage to our craft. This is exactly what we like to see. Unfortunately, no mission from that one, but... Alright, so he's not... Oh, it says that I don't have a chance to beat this thing? I thought with the explosives upgrade we could take one of these out. Oh, we'll tail him until overland and then try it anyway. It might be saying that because of the health difference. Alright, so we're going to engage him. Okay, so that takes care of one of them. Uh, we're not going to be able to get there before the night comes, so we'll have to wait for that one to come into the morning. If we even decide to do that one, we might not. We'll have to wait and see what kind of luck we have over here. Which... How much fuel do we have left? Uh, fuel. 60%. We'll give him a little bit more time. No, okay, he's heading out into the ocean. So we're just going to engage this thing because it's not going to come back over land for us. Come on, why are you... Okay, he is. I thought he wasn't targeting him there for a second, which I was a little worried about. Huh, alright. Good to know. I thought that was going to be enough to take one of them down. Well, we can set, uh, get this guy out of this battle, and then get him rearmed and send him back after it. Luckily, they I'm pretty sure anyway, they remember the damage, so you can send multiple waves of fighters if you really need to. We definitely need to get more Foxtrots over here, though. Do we have our fox trot ready to go yet? Not yet. Not even close. That guy is gonna cause us issues, isn't he? All right, fox trot three is ready to go back up into the air. So let's get this guy out of the out of the sky. Hail him until overland, because hopefully we can get a mission out of this. But he seems to be going out into the ocean. Oh, maybe not. How much fuel do we have left? Uh, that's not what I wanted. 57. I don't know. Okay, no. He's not gonna... He's not gonna cooperate here, so let's just kill him. I'd much rather take him down and get the reputation boost than let him escape back into space. So less than ideal there, but this crash site is finally in the open. It's only a light scout though. And it's a farm map. You know what, I'm just gonna bomb this one. We can use the extra funds to get back to work on our... Um, on our precision laser. And then maybe even start working on some foxtrots here shortly.
All right, so there's our precision laser. We'll get them working on a Foxtrot, even though they won't be able to finish it until we get more money. Yeah, so there goes that. Come on. Give me a UFO I can actually, that's actually worth doing. No, well, at least we got the alien electronics done. Recovered examples of alien electronics provide a fascinating window into the future, allowing us to study countless innovations the extraterrestrials used to reduce electronic noise, recreating existing circuitry with alien materials while integrating a few of the simpler alien innovations into the design increases their efficiency by at least a factor of 10, a quite remarkable improvement. The aliens utilize organic compounds such as amino acids in their electronic components, which collectively appear to grant the circuit a limited degree of latent intelligence. This organic computing power continuously analyzes the power demand in the network and channels energy to where it is needed most, either storing or releasing charge from dozens of in integrated capacitors when necessary. The end result is a biological smart grid that can reduce power consumption by almost 50%. The aliens do not have access to vastly larger amounts of energy than us. They also use it more efficiently, too. Our crude rip reproductions of these organic circuits are nowhere near as efficient as the aliens' equivalents, but we will still be, but will still be very useful when building complex m machines such as vehicles or aircraft. A helpful side effect of the intellig intelligent power routing is increased survivability as the power transmission systems will automatically bypass damaged components in a way that conventional systems cannot. And something kind of interesting, just as a little bit of a side note, this type of commuting where they use basically organic material to build the circuit is something that scientists are actually studying right now. There is a version of this that exists. It's not ready for like consumer use or anything like that yet, but it is rather interesting to see. There's like a a fungus that is almost intelligent enough, as there's a fungus that isn't intelligent enough that it can find its own way through a maze, and scientists are kind of using this to try to see if they can turn it into basically a circuit. It's really neat. I wish I could remember the name of the fungus, but I'm not really that good with the scientific names. But it's definitely, if this is interesting to you, it's definitely something you should check out if you haven't already. Alright, so we have electroshock grenades. And, oh wow, I left the 30 scientists on that for quite a while. Oh wait, no, we can research the electroshock grenades. Alright, well we want to get doing that ASAP because those are very good and very important. Alright. Give us some UFOs, please. We're getting closer to the end of the episode and we still haven't even gotten our, any boots on the ground yet. Well, that's something at least. Alright, so that is a... What size is that? Wow, we have quite a few UFOs right now, actually. That's number 28, which is that one, right there. A small 2,000 kilometers per... Okay, we're going to ignore him for the time being. 29 is that one, we're going to ignore him too. The 30 and 31, we're going to go after 31 first since he's closer. So intercept him. We will need both Foxtrots. And UFO 32. We can hopefully take him out in two waves. Alright, so even though he's over water, we're going to engage him anyway, because this isn't where we're going to kill him. And now we run away. Luckily, we were faster than it, so there's no way it can catch us after we uh, get our shots in. Okay, so now Foxtrot 3 can return to base, rearm, go up and shoot that thing down on its next pass. In the meantime, these two Foxtrots can go ahead and just take this guy out entirely. Just fly straight at him. I want to make sure that we can avoid that forward-facing thing if at all possible. There we go. Alright, so we finally have a mission that's worth doing. Unfortunately, it's 
just going into the night time, so we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to wait on that one. You know, what? I'm gonna send up two condors against this guy because they can take that on their own. Are we ready to fight this guy again yet? Not quite yet. Almost. Uh, we're gonna engage here. And as before, head in separate directions and see which one he goes after. He's after number one. And down he goes. I wonder. Actually, we might be able to get them. How much fuel do they have left? 66%. You know what? Return to base and we can send them out again pretty quick. This one we are just going to bomb because we already have a better crash site to do. That gets us a bit more money as well, which is good. Are we ready to go up against this guy again? Yes, we are. All right, Foxtrot 3, go and do your thing. Are we ready to go up against this guy yet? Almost. All right, send up these two Foxtrots. We can take down that one. Uh, let's see if we can't tail him until he goes over land again. This one we can take out. It's a very air-heavy episode. <laughs> Lots of air combat. Yeah, him starting with his back to us doesn't stand a chance. Okay, so now we have two crash sites to choose from. And I think we're about to have a third. Just get them so they're going straight on, essentially. Alright, and three crash sites to choose from. And I'm going to try to do all three, but I'm not 100% sure on how much luck I'm going to have on that one. We shall have to wait and see. Alright, we ran out of money again, no surprise. But luckily, we're about to have a pretty good influx of cash here. Now, in the meantime, let's uh, let's get our soldiers prepared for this mission. So we have our sniper. We should have our precision laser, so we're going to give you that. And just switch you over to a regular old power cell. Let me see, that's only six shots, so you're definitely going to need another power cell. So let's put that there. We maybe give you a gas grenade. Nope. You're pretty much loaded out as you are now. That's good. Now you need a completely new load loadout. Because we do have a scatter laser. These things are fun. I like these. We're going to give her a couple of these. Now the good thing about this is that we've swapped out those heavy... Um, the heavy uh, machine gun ammo. The machine gun ammo is how how heavy? It's four kilograms per box. This stuff is only one kilogram per per cartridge. So, I mean, we're saving quite a bit of, of weight there, which means that we can hopefully carry, you know, things like maybe a first aid kit and maybe even a couple of grenades. Give her smoke and a stun and a high explosive. One of each if we can, and then we'll double up on these ones until we are overweight. Alright, and that's about where we become overweight, which is fine. Unless we want some other equipment for her to use, but I don't think so. Nah, she should be fine as she is. Our shield officer. We didn't really even get a chance to see how well she worked last mission. And I don't think we have any extra laser weapons as it is. No, we don't. Alright, then she can just stay as she is. Her whole purpose is to hold shields anyway. There is a thing you can do where you can put another shield in the primary weapon slot so they're carrying around two shields. I don't like that. That feels cheating to me. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. 
Uh, let me see, we have our rifleman who is already set up, though she might be able to carry some more grenades. So let's get that done. How, what do you have so far? Can you carry an explosive grenade? Yes, you can. And then let's bring along, we see have, we have two of each of those, so... No, okay. That is the limit, which is fine. Same idea here. Can we add another one? Nope. And then we are short a rifleman. We're short of rifleman. So who are we bringing back onto the team? We could bring uh, Goat Fetish on, but I would almost like to start training up some of these privates. So out of the privates, who would make the best rifleman? Who's got the best kind of all-around stats? I'm thinking Private Max Moore is is going to be our man. So, welcome to Charlie One, Max Moore. Goat Fetish, you're going to sit on the sidelines a little bit more. We don't want to put all of our best soldiers on the same mission, in case we have a horrible, horrible accident. Unfortunately, you are a little bit overweight here. So, we'll take off... What can we remove? Yeah, we'll take off one of those. I don't think you'll need... Both cartridges. Okay, and then of course we still have Hunter 001, which needs a better name. I'll have to come up with one a little later. We're already, you know, pretty much at the point where we need to end the episode, and we still don't have any boots on the ground. Let's see, so we're going to send Charlie 1 after this one first, because it's going to be the first one into the light. Alright, and engage. Ooh, an alien officer is present. Commander, we have picked up unusual communication signals emanating from the landing zone. We believe that the area may contain one of the alien officers we need to interrogate. They are likely to be identified by their by their headgear. Please do your best to capture this creature so we can continue to advance our research. Alrighty. So this is where we are going to uh, call this episode, unfortunately. I apologize for the combat light episode, but uh, we had a lot of air combat and a lot of base management that needed to be done. But uh, next episode, this is where we'll pick up from with tons of lasers and explosions and dead aliens for everybody involved. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode and I will see you next time. So long.